All right, so this is the activity, the derivative rules. And so today, uh, we want to try to answer a part of this question. Uh, where do the derivative rules come from? Uh, and so we're going to start with a little bit of uh, review. So over here, I have the nine derivative rules that I've given you on uh, uh, that handout. And we kind of want to attach them over here to where they're uh, going to be used. So for power functions and constants, uh, this is when we use rule one and rule two. Right, so the constant rule, which says the derivative of a constant is 0. And then the power rule, which says the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. And then for natural functions, we have these natural rules down here. So this is number 8. Right? Remember, the natural rules are the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. And of course, then we have those six trigonometric rules. And this, so they go with number 9, so it's how to take derivatives of trigonometric functions. Uh, we use the trigonometric rules for derivatives. Um, so we use this, we use this. And then so f to take derivatives, when you add or subtract functions, of course, the sum or difference rule. So this is both four. And then how do you take a derivative when you multiply two functions? So f times g. So they actually have two rules for that. Uh, one is sort of a subcase. You know, how do you take the derivative of c times constant times a function? And so that's a constant rule, part two. And so that one goes here. So that's part three number three, and then also the product rule, which tells us how to take the derivative of a product of a function. So it's the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. And then for division, of course, it's the quotient rule. So we got that one. And then finally, for composition, we have the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And so that's how the rules match up with the sort of four basic sort of elementary types, uh, functions, power functions, exponential log functions, and trig functions. And then this is how you work with the various operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and composition. So now what we want to do is we want to talk about where these uh, derivative rules actually come from. Uh, so where does the constant rule come from? You know, so why is the derivative of a constant equal to zero? Now there are a couple ways to answer this. You can use your own intuition. And if I use my intuition, I say, you know, I say derivative, and you say rate of change. So if you have a constant function, so if you have f of x equal to a constant, you can say that the rate of change is zero because the function is not changing. So of course, intuitively, that's why the derivative is equal to zero. Uh, but we can actually show this with a definition. So we can say f prime of x, which is equal to, so remember the definition of the derivative is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And then we can just do what it says, and you'll see that we actually get out the number zero, which is the derivative of a constant. So here, if you have f of x plus h, remember f of x plus h is just the constant c. That's the tricky part. So f of x plus h is c minus f of x is c, and then divided by h. And then this is equal to c minus c is zero. So you get the limit as h goes to zero of 0 on top and h on the bottom. Now remember, h is going to 0, so h is not actually ever 0. So it's either a little bit bigger than 0 or a little bit smaller than 0. And 0 over any number that's not 0, of course, is 0. So it's really just a limit as h goes to 0 of 0. And as h goes to 0, then you get out the number 0. And that's really why the derivative of a constant is equal to 0 by the definition of the derivative. Right, so all the rules that we have basically come from the definition of the derivative. And we learn these rules in order to avoid having to use that uh, definition. All right, so that's for the constant rule. And then for the power rule, it's actually a kind of interesting how you, um, how you show that the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. Uh, and so the way this works is we want to make our function here. We're going to make it equal to x to the n. But this is not uh, what we're going to use uh, for the definition. In fact, we're not going to use a definition for this one. In fact, we're going to rewrite it. We're going to rewrite this using e's and ln's. Uh, and the reason for that is that you can show that the function like, let's say we did x cubed. You can show by the definition that f prime of x is equal to 3x squared. We can do the, use a definition to do that. It's not too hard. But if the power is not nice. Right? Remember, n can be any number. It can be you know, pi, it could be 3 fourths. So if the number is not nice, so suppose you had something like this, f of x equal to x to the square root of 2. Mm -hmm. Then when you try to run the definition through that, it really doesn't work very well. There's, there, in fact, there's, 
there's no way to actually show this without actually using E's and LN's in a sense. So what we do is we can convert this to E's and LN's. And so remember, you know, E to the LN of the anything is the anything. They're just inverses of each other. And so we can rewrite this as E to the LN of X to the N. And of course that power can come down in front. That's a property of LN. So this is really E to the N times LN of X. And then what we can do is we can take a derivative of this. And so as long as we believe the natural rules and the chain rule, as long as we know how to show those, we'll get this one for free basically. So the idea is then I can take the derivative using the chain rule. And so you have an outside and an inside. So derivative E is just E again. So we just copy it down. E to the N times ln of x, so all in the exponent. And then times the derivative of the inside, so the derivative inside's n times ln of x, so n's a constant, so you just write down n, times the derivative of ln of x, which is 1 over x. And so then this is equal to, so now remember, this thing here, which is the same as this thing here, which is the same as this thing here, which is really x to the n. So we can sort of rewrite this, if you want, as x to the n times n, times 1 over x, and then just rearrange the terms so you get n times, and then x to the, you have an n here and a 1 down here, so it's, you subtract exponents, so you get n minus 1. All right, so notice we didn't use the definition of all, but what we did use, we did use the chain rule, so we'll need to show why that's true, and we did use the fact that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the derivative of ln of x is ln of x. Now it'll turn out that we can show why the derivative of e to the x is e to the x using the definition, but to understand why the derivative of ln of x is, oh, I'm sorry, not ln of x, right, but 1 over x. So to show why the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x, we'll need something called implicit differentiation. Right? And we'll have to wait a little bit on this one. It's the first lesson um, on the next exam, basically. Differentiation. Implicit differentiation. All right, let's look at the next rule. So the next rule is a constant rule, part two. Uh, and in order to show this one, why this is true, uh, we'll just make a, another function. Let's call it uh, uh, let's call it g of x, which is equal to let's let c times f of x. And on this one, we can use the product rule. So if we show that the product rule is true, this one will follow. And I talked a little bit about this in class. It's like you really don't need the constant rule part two, but it's really nice because a lot of times you're working with a constant times a function. So to take its derivative, it's just a constant times the derivative of the function. But here we can just use a product rule. And so when you use the product rule on this thing, you know, the idea is you have the first function and the second function. And you'll see that the derivative of the first of a constant, we already showed that that's zero, times the second, so times f of x, plus the first times the derivative of the second. So f prime of x. And so of course the first term goes away. It's just zero, so you can just drop it off, and you just get c times f prime of x. And basically, if we know the product rule is true, and we know the derivative of a constant is zero, which we've already shown the derivative of a constant is zero, then we see why this rule actually holds. Now we still do we still need to show uh, the product rule in order for this to work. Alright, so let's go down to the next example, the sum and difference rule. Uh, so to do this one, we'll make a new function. We'll call it s of x for sum. And we're just going to show the sum. You can do the same thing with the difference. So we just want to define this to be f of x plus g of x. And we're going to run the definition of the derivative through this. So to find s prime of x, it's going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of s of x plus h minus s of x. We're just writing down the difference quotient here. And this is all divided by h. And now we're just going to do what it says. So it says take the limit as h goes to 0 of, and then s of x plus h, wherever I see an x, I replace it with x plus h. So you have f of x plus h plus g of x plus h. And of course, then you have minus. You have minus s of x, which is just f of x plus g of x. Make sure you put it in parentheses because you're taking off the whole thing, so f of x plus g of x, and then that's all divided by h. And so now what we can do is we can distribute this minus sign through here and here and kind of recollect terms. 
So what we'll have is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h. And I'll just move over the minus f of x next to it. And then plus, and then we have the g of x plus h. And I'll move the minus g of x over by it. And then, of course, that's all divided by h. And then what we can do now is we're trying to look for, you know, we know the answer. We know the answer is supposed to be f prime of x and g prime of x. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to try to move this h over here and over here. And we can do that because we're adding uh, in the middle. So what we can do is we can rewrite this. We can rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of two difference quotients. You can take the difference quotient of f. We can give the h to those first two terms. And then plus, we can give the h to the last two terms. Two. It's the same thing. And then notice what happens when you run the limit through this. When you run the limit through this, you get the limit of this, which is just f prime of x. And when you take the limit as h goes to 0 of this, you get g prime of x. So the reason why the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives falls right from the definition. Let's look at the next one. So now we want to show the product rule. And this is the first rule that takes a little bit of, uh, little of work. So the product rule says the derivative of the first times the second is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a new function. We'll call it p of x, the same for product. And we'll just be f times f of x times g of x. And what we can do then is we can run the definition through this thing. So p prime of x would equal the limit as h goes to 0 of p of x plus h minus p of x all divided by h. And now, after some work, hopefully we get out this actual rule, because we're trying to figure out where it comes from. And again, we're going to use the definition. And so we basically just do what it says. So what is p of x plus h? Wherever you see an x, you put an x plus h. And so this would be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And then minus the p of x is just f of x times g of x. And that's all divided by h. OK, so now uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to do something that's, that might seem somewhat arbitrary, but you'll see in the end uh, it's not. So what I can do is I can actually add and subtract the same thing uh, on top here. So I am going to uh, do what? I am going to add. Uh, um, I'm going to, well, here, I'm going to subtract uh, an f of x times g of x plus h. And then I'm going to add right next to it an f of x plus g of x plus h. And I'm going to extend this line. So I didn't change the expression at all, because really, what does this equal? If you take away something and you add the same thing, you're really just adding 0. So it's really the same stuff. But what I can do now is I can kind of recollect the terms, and something nice is going to happen. So I have the limit as h goes to 0 of, and I'll have f of x plus h times g of x plus h. And I'm going to do some coloring here for fun. So times g of x plus h, that's that first term. And then I have minus, minus what? I'm going to move this little term over, and you'll see why in a minute. So I have f of x times, and in, in red, We'll write g of x plus h. Let's make things pop. So I just move that term over. And then I have plus. And I'm going to write this term next to it. So then I have plus uh, f of x. And f of x I'm going to do in green. You'll see why in a minute here. So then I have f of x. And then I'll multiply that by g of x plus h. So I'm moving this term over here over a little bit. Just rearranging the terms, which is fine. Addition is what we call commutative. 
and then I'll have this f of x times g of x, so minus f of x times g of x, and I'll do the f again in green, and then times the g of x. And of course that's all divided by h. And so I just rewrote the terms up here and down here, but what you'll notice is that I can factor out this g of x plus h in these first two terms and factor out the f of, a, f of x in this second two terms, and you're basically going to get the difference quotients back of uh, that f and g in certain spots. So let's see this, so the limit as h goes to 0, and I can rewrite this as f of x plus h minus f of x, and of course that'll all be times that red g of x plus h. And then we have a plus. And then what I can do here is I can factor out this f of x, because they have that in common of those two terms. And so in green, I'll factor out the f of x. And then what do I have left over? I have left over that g of x plus h minus a g of x. And if you think about it, it's really starting to look like uh, what I have up here. It's like you have the derivative, and this is sort of like the derivative right here, times g, that's kind of like times g, plus f, plus f, times the derivative of g. And this is sort of like the derivative of g. I can make this look exactly like it, basically, by giving that h, by giving the h to this difference and this difference. And so what happens is I can rewrite this as f of x plus h minus f of x, and we'll divide that all by h, and then of course times that g of x plus h, so times g of x plus h, and then plus that f of x And then that's times the g of x plus h minus g of x. So g of x plus h minus g of x, all divided by h. And when you run the limit through this, what happens? So let's think about this. When you run the limit through this, this right here, the limit as h goes to 0 of f x, gives you the f prime of x. As h goes to 0 here, the h goes away, and you just get g of x plus, as h goes to 0, this is just left alone, so it's just f of x. And as the h goes to 0 here, this is equal to g prime of x. And so that's where the product rule comes from if you use the definition of the derivative. All right, so remember, intuitively, it doesn't tell us much of anything. Right? Intuition can be hard to come from, especially when you're working with rates of change and you're uh, you're multiplying. Although, if we go back to the uh, one we did before, you know, it, here basically you're seeing the rate of change of a fun function plus another function is simply the rate of change of the first function plus the rate of change of the second function, which actually makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, but it's harder to understand, you know, the product rule and gain some intuition behind it. There are there are ways to see this uh, geometrically. But today, I'm just practicing sort of using the definition to show you where these things kind of come from. And really, the important part of this is to see this idea that when we're trying to show something's true, a lot of times we have to sort of manipulate it, sort of massage it algebraically. And a lot of times, the way we do that is we see it from adding and subtracting the same uh, thing. Okay, so let's look at a next example, ah, which is the quotient rule. Now, the quotient rule, we don't actually need a definition. Uh, to show why this is true. So we'll make a new function here, we'll call it the quotient, q of x, and we'll define it to be f of x over g of x. And of course the question is, why is the quotient rule true? Why right, is so it low d high minus high d low all over low squared, and away we go. And the way we're going to prove this is we're actually turned into a product rule problem. So you can turn this into a pro pro product rule problem by writing as f of x times g of x to the negative 1. And now we can use a product rule on it, along with a chain rule, right? So we already showed the product rule, why it's true. We still need to show why the chain rule works the way that it does. 
But if we want to find its derivative, what we can do is we can do a product rule, where of course this is the first function, f of x, and then g of x, the negative one, is the second. So what we get is the derivative of the first, so f prime of x, times the second, so times g of x to the negative one, and then plus the first, so plus f of x, times the derivative of the second. So there is a second, it's actually a chain rule, so you have an inside and an outside raised to the negative one, so the derivative, the negative one comes down, we're doing the derivative of the outside, and you get g of x to the negative one minus one, which is negative two, and of course times the derivative of the inside, so times g prime of x. And we should probably clean this up a little bit before we simplify it. So this is going to be equal to, and so what do we have? So we have f prime of x times this g of x to the negative 1. And then that's a minus and a plus, so that'll be a minus. And then we have minus an f of x times this g of x to the negative 2 and then that's times g prime of x. And so now we want to factor out what they have in common. So you notice that they have a g of x in common. And remember the rules, you always factor out the lowest power. So negative 1 versus negative 2, we'll factor out the negative 2, and we'll play this game, because negative 2 is smaller than negative 1. Something minus something. So what goes here times this is that. And we need an f prime of x, so I'm going to write f prime of x here. And we need g of x to the negative 1. I might have g of x to the negative 2, so the idea is just write g of x. So g of x times g of x to the negative 1, really there's a 1 power here we're not writing, and they add and you get negative 1. So this times this is that. So then over here, what do we need? Well, we just need the f of x, because f of x times this will be that. And then we're still missing the g prime of x, so we need a g prime of x too. And hopefully you see this is starting to look like the difference quotient, and we're basically done. I right, remember negative 2, when you raise something to negative 2, means negative means put it back in the denominator or down in the denominator, and the 2 means square it. So what we have here is g of x on top times f prime of x on top minus an f of x times g prime of x all on top. And then that's all divided by this g of x all being squared. And that's the quotient rule. So the quotient rule comes from sort of a combination of the product rule and chain rule. And so again, we still need to show why the chain rule is true. So let's look at the next question. Ah, which is the chain rule. So why is the chain rule the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside? So again, the intuition is a little hard to come by, uh, but we can try to use the definition to kind of feel out why this might be uh, the case. So let's define a function. We we'll use c of x for sort of chain of functions. And this is then, we'll write f of g of x. And then we can use the definition. So what's the definition? c prime of x would equal. And we would write the limit as h goes to 0 of, of what? Of c of x plus h minus c of x. And of course, that's all divided by h. And then we just do what it says. And so what does this say? Uh, this says the limit as h goes to 0 of, and then c of x plus h, wherever you see an x, you just put an x plus h. So it's f of g of x plus h, and then minus f of g of x. And that's all divided by h. And now I'm going to do something that you may not realize what I'm doing at first, but eventually you'll see, oh, that's why we're doing this. I want to, I already know what I want to kind of happen here. I, you know, I, I want it to be the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. So I need to get this g prime of x uh, somewhere. So I'm looking for this difference quotient. You know, g of, I'm really looking for this, right? I'm looking to see if I can't somehow put this in here in an easy way. This is sort of my idea. And I can do that by multiplying top and bottom by the same thing. There may be a, there are some slight complications with this, but we're going to kind of overlook them because uh, in general, I'm just trying to get a feel for why this might be the case from the definition. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by g of x plus h minus g of x. And I can do this because remember, what am I really multiplying here by? I'm really just multiplying by the number 1. 
And I can always multiply something by the number 1 and get the same thing back. So they should be exactly the same. And then I can kind of move things around because I can actually put this h over here and this g of x plus h underneath here. So this is really the limit the limit as h goes to 0 of f of g of x plus h, this top part's going to stay the same, minus an f of g of x. And then I'm going to move this g of x plus h minus g of x right down here. So g of x plus h minus g of x. And then I'm just going to move that h over here. So times g of x plus h minus g of x all divided by h. And you can do that. I mean, you can move around. You basically have like a times b, you know, like 2 times 3. And I'm just going to write it as 3 times 2. And that's fine. But notice this thing here is the difference quotient. So when I run the limit through this thing, what's going to happen is that's going to be like g prime of x. And that's good, because that's what I want. I want this derivative of the outside here. Now, this doesn't quite look like the derivative of the inside, but it's getting closer. And so to make it look like that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little trick. And it's kind of a funny little thing, but I'm going to write down h, just capital H. I'm going to let capital H be g of x plus h minus g of x. And so if h is equal to g of x plus h minus g of, g of x, I can also say then if you add g of x to both sides, that h uh, plus g of x is equal to g of x plus h. And so what I can do then is I can take this thing and remove it and put this thing in here. And then I can take this thing, oops, let me circle the right thing. All right, so I'm going to take, not up there, but right here, I'm going to take this thing out and replace it with this thing. And then I'm going to take the bottom out right here and replace it with it, this thing. So it's just a, substi a substitution, basically. So what we get here is equal to, and I'll have the limit as h goes to 0, of f of, and I have h plus g of x, which you can just write as g of x plus h. It's the same thing. And then all minus f of g of x. And then all divided by big H. And so I just take this thing and replace it with big H. And that's still being times then, times what? Times g of x plus h minus g of x all divided by little h. And then notice what happens here is when you run the limit through this thing. So when I run the limit through this thing, as h goes to 0, right, so think about this on the side I'm thinking about this, as h goes to 0, Right, what happens to big H? Well, look, big H is this. So as H goes to 0, this is going to go to g of x, and g of x minus g of x is h. h is 0. Right, so basically, as h goes to 0, this will imply that big H is also going to go to 0. And so here, you basically have the difference quotient again, but instead of the difference quotient of f of x, you have the difference quotient of f of g of x, and when you run that limit as h goes to 0, what's going to happen this is going to be f prime of, and instead of x inside, you have g of x. And then times, and of course, this thing, right, that's the difference quotient. So you run the limit, h goes to 0 through it. You get the definition of g prime of x. And so you see the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And again, we're not using our intuition. We're trying to follow, uh, find out why it's this case from the definition, which is not very illuminating, but what's nice about this is you see sort of a common technique we use to show why things are true in mathematics, which is, you know, we multiply by this thing here, um, which is basically 1. And we're doing this to sort of, we kind of know what's going to happen, you know, so maybe mathematically, you know, this is discovered through example, and then to figure out why it's true, it's going to run through the definition and kind of manipulate it algebraically, or you can massage it algebraically, uh, to turn it into what you want. Uh, and the way we massage this one is we multiply top and bottom by the same thing. Whereas in the last problem, or the one before this, right, we added and subtracted the same thing to turn into what we want.
because that's just a zero, adding a zero to something. Okay, so um, let's move on. And so what do we have left? Ah, the natural function. So now we showed why this is true in a homework assignment. Uh, we can sketch the proof if you want real quickly. So remember the way this works is we let our function be e to the x and then to find its derivative we simply run through the definition. So it's simply the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And again we just do what it says. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 and f of x plus h is e to the x plus h minus e to the x all over h. And then here we can use a property of exponents that you have e to the x plus h. Oh, here's, here's the property, right? If you have a to the x plus y, it's the same as a to the x times a to the y. And so we can use that property at the limit as h goes to 0. If this is e to the x times e to the h minus e to the x. And the reason we did that is now at least I can factor out something and factor out what they have in common. So this is the same thing as the limit as h goes to 0 of e to the x times e to the h minus 1 and that's all over h. And then we can use the properties of limits or the limit laws we talked about that this is actually considered to be a constant because it's not changing as h changes so you can actually just kind of pull it out. So you can pull out that e to the x and then look at this limit as h goes to 0 of e to the h minus 1 over h and to understand that you basically need to make a table. And we did this in the homework, so I'm going to let you, you know, fill in the blanks if you want to. But the idea is you look, you make a little table for h and e to the h minus 1 all divided by h. And you'd plug in numbers close to um, 0, right? So 0 0.01 and on both sides. And what you'll see is you get out approximately 1 here and approximately 1 here. And so then we know that this is then e to the x and since this limit, right, since e to the h minus 1 over h is approaching 1, we say the limit is 1, of course, that's times 1, so we get back e to the x. So it follows right from the definition of the derivative. That's what we're using there. And then we move on to ln of x. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you why this is true until we learn implicit differentiation. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, we did a little bit of this in class uh, last time, uh, but I'm going to wait until the next lesson and I'll show you exactly why the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. And then finally, we're going to move on to the trigonometric rules. And now I'm not going to do all of these because it would take a long time to do, uh, do all of them. I'm just going to do one of them. I'm going to show you why the derivative of sine of x is actually cosine of x, using again the definition of the derivative. And so we'll make our function, let's just call f of x equal to sine of x. And this follows again right from the definition. So we can write down the definition of f prime of x, the derivative of f, is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. And then we just do what it says. So what does it say to do? It says wherever you see an x, put an x plus h. So we have the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x all over h. And here's where you may get stuck. But I'm remembering some of my trig, and there's actually a, a trig rule that tells me how to work with a sine of an angle plus an angle. So there's a rule here, a trig formula if you want, that says it's the sine of alpha plus beta is equal to, and it's the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the sine of beta times the cosine of alpha. And there's actually also a rule for cosine of alpha plus beta. And it is the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta and then minus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta. And you may wonder how in the heck do you remember these rules 
And it's actually not that hard to remember. Um, so if you think about this, I always say to myself, the sign has the same sign, but something's different. Right? So always, there's always something the same and always different. So the sign has the same sign, so it's plus, and the different part goes sine, cosine. Now the cosine doesn't have the same sign, but something's the same. Right? So that's why this is minus, and then this cosine, cosine. Cosine, cosine's the same, and sine, sine's the same. So you know you can make up little sayings, and if you get get ones that you know work for you, then they're not too hard to uh, memorize. And there are other ways to show actually to remember this. And in fact, um, once you guys start really working with complex uh, numbers, there's a very simple way to actually show where these formulas actually come from. And that's really how I I uh, I know them. I I I learn it from some with working with complex numbers and exponents, basically. But as a student, when I learned trigonometry, what I learned is, hey, the sign here has the same sign, so it's a plus, but something's different. So it goes sine, cosine. Where down here, when I'm working with the cosine, it doesn't have the same sign, so it's minus. So it's a plus, it's a minus, but something's the same. So it's cosine, cosine, and sine, sine. That's the same part. So what you can do then is we can use that top formula here, this formula right here on top, and we can rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times cosine of h plus sine of h times cosine of x. And then, of course, minus the sine of x on the very end. And then all divided by h. And I'm going to kind of move around some terms here because I want to collect sort of like terms together. So you'll notice here. We have a couple like terms. You know, you see the sine of x and sine of x. I can move those together because something nice is going to happen. Now, you wouldn't know this until you see it, but once you see this enough times, you're like, oh, I kind of get the idea. You just kind of manipulate it again, massage it algebraically. So we're going to move over those things. So I have a sine of x, a cosine of h, and I have a minus sine of x here, and I have a plus a sine of h cosine of x over here. And then what I can do is I can kind of factor out some stuff uh, that this has in common. So remember I just moved that stuff over so this first term, these first two terms, I can factor out this sine of x. They have that in common. And then I can give the h to the, each of these. So let, let's do this in two steps so you can kind of see. Oops. So I can actually rewrite this as the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times cosine of h minus 1. And then you have this plus sine of h cosine of x here. And this is all divided by h. And so things are becoming clearer to me. They're probably a little less clear to you, but you'll see kind of what happens in, in the end. So I basically, I just factored out that sine of x from the first two terms. And then I'm going to give this h to each of these two terms. Since you're adding, I can give them to h, of, to h to each of them. And so what I have now will be this limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times, I'm going to write this as cosine h minus 1 all divided by h. So we give h that first term, plus, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. So I'll write this as cosine of x times, and I'll probably the sine of h on the right, and this is also divided by h. And let's, put it, let's just put it in parentheses for fun. So it pops. And when you run the limit through this, here's what's going to happen. So I'm going to take the limit as h goes to 0 of this thing. Now notice sine of x doesn't change, so you're just going to get sine of x back here. And then we'll write the limit on this thing. So the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine of h minus 1 all divided by h plus we can run a limit through the addition and that cosine of x isn't going to change as h changes so it's just a constant so we can just write it down and then times the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h. Now these things are limits that we've actually done before in the notes or in the lecture videos and you can do these limits by simply making tables if you want. So you make a table here, do h, do cosine of h minus 1 all over h on your calculator. Pick a number close to 0, like 0 0.01, negative 
zero, 0.01, make sure you're in radians. And what you're going to see is you get out a number approximately 0. Approximately 0. So this thing is going to be 0. And so we're going to get sine of x all times 0. And then plus, we have cosine of x times, and now here we're going to have to do a table to figure out what this thing is. So again, you can do h. Over here, we're going to do sine of h divided by h. And again, your calculator needs to be in radians, and we've got to pick numbers close to 0 because h is going to 0. So we'll pick a number like 0 0.01 or negative point zero and negative point zero one. You want to look from the right and left, right? And you plug it in here, and you'll see you get a number approximately 1. Approximately 1. It won't be exact, but it should be close to, so times 1. So, of course, the first term goes away, and we're left with the cosine of x. So sort of like magic, using the definition, and sort of manipulating a bit algebraically and recollecting terms, right? Algebra, we get out the cosine uh, of x. And you can do this thing also for uh, the derivative of cosine of x. And then remember, for the tan of x, you don't have to use a definition because you can rewrite the tan of x in terms of the sine and cosine. So you can rewrite this as sine of x over cosine of x. And now take a derivative of this using the quotient rule. And all these derivatives can be found sort of in a similar, a similar way as this. You don't need to rely on a definition. Um, just, you just need to do it for the sine of x and cosine of x. But that's the idea. All right, so do we have anything else left? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The trigonometric rules part two. So this has to, be, this has to do with working with how do you find the derivatives of the sine inverse of x, the inverse trigonometric functions. And we're going to save this to another time because, again, we need something called implicit uh, differentiation. It's the easiest way to show you uh, why these derivatives work the way that they uh, do. But uh, we'll show this uh, next time uh, when we learn implicit differentiation. And that's it. All right, so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about where these derivative rules uh, actually come from.